Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dye, and we're gonna start off chapter eight looking at Mendel's experiments. Johann Gregor Mendel was a lifelong learner, teacher, scientist, uh, and also a monk. Um, and he joined the Augustinian Abbey of St. Thomas in uh, Brno in the Czech Republic, uh, where he taught physics, botany, and the natural sciences. And it's kind of an interesting little note to put along here. So this is the mid 1800s. Um, it was not unusual for a lot of the science being done um, to be done either by very, very wealthy people who had lots of free time or um, priests and monks because they also had a lot of uh, dedicated available time that didn't have to be used say, making a living. So in 1856, uh, Mendel embarked on a decade-long research endeavor to study um, inheritance patterns. Uh, and he, he told, so he, he was Catholic, uh, he told the church, like, this is what I want to do. And he was given resources for it. Um, and that sometimes surprises people that, um, that such a big religious institution um, supported the sciences. But uh, it did then, and um, interestingly enough, uh, sometimes it still does now, too. Um, he initially investigated honeybees, uh, but also plants, right? There, there's interconnection in there, right? The honeybees uh, pollinate the plants. But anyway, he eventually decided to focus in on pea plants as his primary model system. Um, in 1865, so this is you know, after his 10-year research project, um, Mendel presented the results of his experiments um, involving nearly 30,000 pea plants. Um, he presented them to the local Natural History Society, uh, where he demonstrated that the traits are transmitted uh, faithfully from parent to offspring in very specific patterns. Um, he published this work in 1866, uh, which it's considered groundbreaking, right? His experiments in plant hybridization, it's the name of the, um, the book, or paper, because it's more like a long paper. Um, and it was published in the Proceedings of uh, the Natural History Society of Brune, um, which is great, except um, it went completely unnoticed <laughs> by the scientific community. So um, at the time, so the, right, this is mid-1800s, um, which to give you context, in this same time period, right, in the United States, uh, we are gearing up for our big civil war, right? Um, so, you know, he's in the Czech Republic and, and, and nobody really notices, um, globally, not, not in Europe, certainly not in the United States. Um, and they weren't sending this kind of information. They weren't sharing it out to, um, any of the Asian continent or into India. They just didn't share information in the same way at the time. Um, so, so like I said, it, it went largely unrecognized. Um, and the scientific community at the time actually believed in something called blending, blending of parental traits. Um, so think tall parent and short parent equals medium height child. Um, and this was due to the concept of a continuous variation, um, which I see it in human height. We see it in other things too. Um, but something discontinuous variation. So Mendel's experiments focused on traits that exhibited this discontinuous variation where individuals show one um, of two or very few, sometimes there's more than two, uh, very easily distinguishable traits, right? This allowed him to demonstrate that the traits were inherited as distinct entities, uh, not as blends. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about lots of examples as we go through this chapter. All right, so he publishes his paper, it gets put out into the world, and nobody really notices. So 1868, uh, Mendel becomes uh, the abbot of the monastery that he was um, a monk at, and he shifts his focus from scientific pursuits to um, pastoral duties. You know, his, his job shifted. They needed him to be in charge at this point. So um, like I said, his, his work went largely unrecognized um, during his lifetime. It wasn't until the 1900s that his work was rediscovered and reproduced and revitalized by modern, more modern scientists. Um, this is especially in the lead up to the discovery of chromosomes as the basis for heredity. Uh, and, and this is all very, you know, it all is very stepwise. 
uh, there were big fights over where genetic material was stored. You know, we can thank Mendel for figuring out this, this piece that, you know, is clearly passed on from parent to offspring, but where that information was stored or even what kind of molecule it was, you know, today we think nothing of as DNA. Obviously it was DNA and chromosomes. We didn't know and we didn't have microscopes powerful enough to see for a long time after, uh, after Mendel's work. Uh, in fact, it's not till the 1950s that we actually have the first decent, um, strong piece of evidence that shows us that DNA is the molecule holding our genetic information. Um, so, so yeah, this is this you know, a hundred year journey um, to get from Mendel's earlier observations to oh, it's DNA and chromosomes. That's how we're inheriting traits from our um, from our parents. All right. So why did Mendel choose peas? Um, well, there's several reasons. So uh, peas are naturally self-fertilizing. They contain both male and female reproductive organs on the plant. Um, the reproductive organs in plants are classified by the size of the gamete they produce. Um, so smaller pollen-producing organs are considered male, while the larger um, ovule-producing um, organs are female. Um, Garden peas are what we call true breeding, meaning they consistently produce offspring that resemble the parent. Um, this consistency allowed Mendel to avoid unexpected traits in the experiment. And this has to do with, remember a slide or two ago, mentioned having very few traits or very few um, variations on a single trait. Um, you need things very clear like that. If you have like five different alleles, we'll talk vocab more as we go along, but if you have five different alleles for a trait, it can be a little unclear, like dominance, co-dominance, and like I said, we'll get into it, but he needed traits that were, were very, very clear, true breeding traits. Okay, so another reason is that garden peas mature within one season. And this allowed him to study multiple generations in a relatively short period of time. You know, he had this 10 year block that he did this work in. Um, there's also the ability to cultivate large quantities of garden peas simultaneously. Uh, and this really helped to ensure that his results were not due to chance, right? I mean, big plot of land and grow a whole bunch of peas on it. It's not like if you were to try to do this with dogs where you're heavily limited by space and generation time and number of offspring. You, know, you wanna pick an organism that uh, allows you to have many, many offspring to observe in a very short period of time. So you wouldn't want oak trees as another example. They take decades to mature <laughs> um, and have very few offspring that lead to mature plants. Anyway, all right, so Mendel conducted hybridization by mating two true breeding individuals with different traits. This involved uh, manually transferring pollen from one variety's mature pea plant to another variety's stigma, okay? Um, and so when we say two different true breeding plants, this is a simple example, we'll use flower color. There are purple flowers and white flowers for peas. Um, and so he, would, he observed and plants that every generation only produced white peas. He kept those separate. And then he had ones that only ever produced purple flower offspring. And he, he separated them. And then he did the pollination himself to make sure that he got his hybrids. All right. Um, the plants used in the first generation crosses, those are referred to as P. That's your parental generation. And those plants are your true breeding plants. Uh, Mendel collected their seeds, which grew into the F1, or first filial generation. Um, filial uh, offspring, if, you know, horses like filly, like a female um, horse offspring, if that helps you think of it. It's the offspring, it's the first generation offspring. So the F1 generation uh, was allowed to self-fertilize. All right, so he didn't mess with them. He, um, he took the parental generation, did the pollinization, collected those seeds, and then planted them away from everything else again um, and allowed them to self-fertilize, um, producing the F2 generation or second filial generation. Um, so Mendel's experiments went far beyond just the F2 generation um, and extended to subsequent generations like F3 and F4 and, and on and on. Um, however, it was the ratio characteristics 
um, in the P, F1, and F2 generations that form the basis for his postulates, all right? Um, and, and we'll see, those generations follow, there's this very nice ratio, this very nice pattern that's going to emerge. Okay, so his 1865 publication, let's talk about that a little bit. So Mendel reported the results of these crosses, right, involving seven characteristics. So he didn't just look at flower color. He looked at seven key true breeding characteristics in these pea plants. Um, and each of those had two, just two contrasting traits. Okay. So we have purple flowers, white flowers, um, seed shape, wrinkled or smooth. Um, oh, there's a whole bunch. Um, color, yellow versus green seeds, that kind of thing. Um, so a trait is a variation in the physical appearance of a heritable characteristic, right? So flower color, um, seed color, seed texture. Um, let's see, some other characteristics he included were plant height, um, pea pod size, pea pod color, and flower position, which I thought was an interesting one. Um, all right, results. So Mendel used plants that bred true, right? This is very important for the parental generation. So again, we'll stick with our flower color example. So white or violet or purple flowers. Um, all self-crossed offspring of white flowered parents had white flowers. Okay, so if you take two true breeding white flowered plants and pollinate them, um, you will always get white flowers, okay? And then two violet flowered plants that always produce violet or purple flowered plants um, will always produce, when bred together, will always produce purple flowered plants. Okay. Um, pea plants um, otherwise are physically identical. Um, so that ensures that it's only the flower color that differed in these ones that he was breeding here. Okay. So he made sure that all of them had say that those other traits they weren't varying so the the seeds the height the texture he made sure that all matched um except for the flower color okay all right so that f1 hybrid generation so mendel uh, took the purple flower pollen and he applied it to the white flower stigma and he also did the reverse he took um white flower pollen and applied it to purple flower stigma he, he did he did both um 100 of the f1 generation had violet flowers purple flowers um that doesn't align with the blending expectation right if if genetics are you know a blending of the parents what color would you expect the flowers to be of a purple parent and a white parent well like a light purple right lilac let's say but they weren't Every single offspring was violet, purple. Um, okay, so he's got this whole patch full of purple flowered plants. That's strange. I had purple parents and I had white parents and all of their offspring are purple. Hmm. So he let that patch self-pollinate, okay? And this produced the seeds for the F2 generation. So, in the F2 generation, we have 705 plants that have purple flowers. And then we have 224 with white flowers. I know. The white flowers skipped a generation. We didn't have any white flowers in F1. Well, that ratio is roughly three to one. Three purple flowered plants for every one white flowered plant. And that ends up being incredibly important. So Mendel constructed reciprocal crosses involving transfer of pollen and ovum in, in lots of different directions. No matter how he did this, he got the three to one ratio, um, regardless of if it was, the, you know, the white flower pollen versus the purple flower pollen. If you breed a true breeding white flower plant to a true breeding purple flower plant, you're going to get F1, all the offspring are purple, and in that F2, you're going to have three quarters of the offspring purple and one quarter of the offspring will be white. All right. Um, he did the same experiment 
for the six other characteristics. Now, it's not like he waited. He was doing these simultaneously in separate plots of, of land. Um, but this held true for every one of these traits, okay? Um, the, the one of the traits would disappear in the F1 generation and it would reappear in the F2 in a three to one ratio. Um, really, I mean, and, and if you've done a Punnett square before, you, you, you already know, you know what's coming. Um, if you haven't, it's, it's really, it's quite elegant actually how this all works out. So what he posits is that there are dominant and recessive traits. So some characteristics could be divided this way. Not all, but, you know, we're, and we're going to talk about some that are different later in the chapter. Um, but dominant traits are inherited unchanged in hybridization. But recessive traits become latent or hidden, um, and they can reappear in the progeny of hybrids. So our example, right, the purple flower color is the dominant variation of the trait. And the white flower color is the recessive or latent uh, variation of the trait. All right, so recessive traits reappearing in the F2 generation meant that traits remained separate. They were not blending in that F1 generation. They are distinctly separate entities. Um, each parent transmitted uh, one of their two copies of the trait to offspring where they came together, okay? Um, the dominant trait observed could indicate two dominant versions of the trait or one dominant and one recessive version of the genetic of the trait, okay? Uh, recessive traits being observed meant that the organism does not carry a copy of the dominant trait. Instead, it carries two copies of that recessive trait. All right, so that's a little bit of the history to kind of how we got to where we are today with our understanding of at least Mendelian genetics. It's a much huger field than just that today. Um, I will see you in our next video where we're going to dig into the laws of inheritance.